In today's video, we will be going over the SSIS NAV components, which are included in the SSIS Integration Toolkit for Microsoft Dynamics 365. The Connection Manager is needed to establish a connection to Dynamics NAV or BC environment, and we will be used alongside the Source component for reading or the Destination component for writing data to our target NAV system. We will start with the Connection Manager. In our integrated services project, we can create this by going to the Connection Manager window and selecting Create New Connection. From the drop-down, find the Dynamics Nav Connection Manager and select. Under the general page, you can see that we support uh, REST, OData, and SOAP service endpoints. In all three endpoints, you would be able to select the server version from the drop-down. We support both Dynamics Nav and Business Central for all three types. We also support the same authentication methods for REST, OData, and SOAP. For the first method, authorization code, first we may enter the service URL. Please note this would include the tenant ID value. The service URL will be different for the three different endpoints. Also note, if a service URL from a different type has already been entered, the component will automatically adjust the format if changing the service endpoint. For the token path, you may click the ellipses to choose an existing token. Otherwise, you may generate a new token file by clicking the Get New Token button. You may find the details within your Azure portal. The tenant ID can be found in the overview, the client ID under the apps overview, the client secret is generated under certificates and secrets tab, new secret, and you'll be providing a name and an expiry. And please note that the value field is the relevant one that we want. So in the next tab, you can see the certificate. Here you would be able to upload your certificate and then copy the thumbprint, which would be relevant in the uh, certificate option. Lastly, for the redirect URI, this one you'd be able to find under the Apps Authentication tab, Add Redirect URI. If you have an existing one, you can also just copy one of those. A default set of scopes are pre-populated and you may enable editing by clicking the lock icon. This would allow you to change the delegated permissions requested. You will be authorizing the token by logging in and storing the resulting token on your machine. Once we have the redirected URL, we can copy this back into our component Lastly, you would be prompted to set a password for the token and then choose a physical location for it. The company dropdown would be made available, so you may select one from the dropdown list. The second option, client credentials, this would be very similar to the authorization code authentication, but this method is a server to server authentication and we will use an application user. We can enter the service URL, which is the URL that provides access to your environment, the client app ID, and the client secret may be found within Azure portal, as shown previously. Lastly, we can select the company from the dropdown as before. The third option, certificate. Before authenticating using this method, you will need to upload your certificate file to Azure portal under the app certificate and secrets tab, as shown before. The certificate's thumbprint value in Azure portal will be used in the certificate thumbprint in our connection manager. The service URL will also be the same as the previous authentication method. The client ID is will be found in the overview within Azure portal. And lastly, as before, the company dropdown will be made available and you can select your company from the list. For the REST, OData, and SOAP endpoint when working with a server version other than Business Central Online, the authentication type BASIC would be selected. You need to enter the NAV application server you want to establish a connection to under NAV server. The Use Integrated Authentication checkbox may be selected if working with an Active Directory type. The service URL would be automatically populated based on the NAV server provided. If not working with Integrated Authentication, you may enter the username and password. And then, just like the other types, you will be able to select the company from the drop-down below. The last two service settings at the bottom uh, will apply to any of the configurations you select. The service timeout by default is set to 120 seconds, and this would be the allotted time to wait for response from the server before a timeout error occurs. You may ignore certificate errors by enabling the last option, and this would be helpful to prevent SSL certificate errors on your development machine or trusted server when connecting to the server. Please note in production this would generally not be recommended unless you can guarantee your connection is secure. In the second page, Advanced Settings, we can set some additional settings as needed. For the tenant, this may be provided here if working with the OAuth authentication types. 
the retry on intermittent error would be enabled and this would allow our components to retry if it detects a brief intermittent error that has occurred and can help in these cases to retry the request using our retry mechanism and set intervals rather than having the execution entirely fail. We can set the proxy configuration as needed. By default, this is set to no proxy, but you can use auto detect if you have a system configure proxy. Otherwise, you may select manual to manually include proxy server and enable the proxy authentication require checkbox to include credentials. The last page more info provides basic information about the toolkit and the version. Uh, once ready, you may click OK to save your configuration. To read data from your Dynamics Nav environment, we'll be working with our source component. And once we drag and drop it, we can open the component. Please note that we already have two destinations ready because we want to showcase that there's a primary output as well as one or more child outputs. We may select the connection manager that we created from before. And from this point, we'll be able to choose the source object that we want to work with. As you can see, another child object has popped up, and this will occur if the entity has child objects or line items. So we'll select the sales invoice lines as an example, and each additional one will create a new output. Please note that these aren't required, but um, if you need any for your integration, you may check any that are needed. The batch size lets you set how many records you want to retrieve in each call, and the max row returned. By default, it's set to zero, which means that it's gonna read all the returned rows but you may also limit this to, for example, the first 500 rows. We may set a filter by clicking the ellipsis, and from here we get to the OData Query Builder. In this dropdown, we can select the entity that we want to query on. In this dropdown, we can select a field and set the condition to be either a static value or a variable. And please note that there is also a custom query mode at the bottom, which will allow you to manually enter the filter. You may select the field that you would want to order by, and then whether you want to have it ascending or descending. If you are working with a SOAP service endpoint, there will be two sections, the first being page filtering and the second is supplementary parameters. For page filtering, this lets you specify a nav filter criteria to help retrieve certain records. You may insert user variables or replace any static values with a variable into the filter by putting the cursor in the location or highlighting the section to replace. For supplementary parameters, when working with specific objects, if there are special parameters required in order to read these objects, you may include those parameters here as well. Once our general page is configured, we can switch over to the columns tab. The first column here would be the fields that we want to select to continue downstream. The top button here is convenient because you can either select all or deselect all. And then any fields that we want to exclude, we can just uncheck them. The second column here will just be the name of the nav field in your environment. And the third column will be the data type. Please note that for string and numeric types, you'll be able to adjust this if needed. And then as we can see here at the top, right now we're working with the primary output, but we also have another output and we can switch over to the details of that one. And then if you want to hide your selected fields, you can do that by selecting this. And then you can also hide unselected fields by enabling this. If you have any new fields added into your configuration, you may also refresh the component and any new fields that our component finds will be included in this metadata. So once we're happy with our configuration, we can press OK to save. And as mentioned before, uh, since we're working with a primary output and a child item, so our primary output has already been mapped from before, but we may also map our child output by dragging and dropping it to our destination. When we want to work with the Dynamics Nav destination, we can find it in the SSIS toolbox, drag and drop it, as an example, in another data flow, we have added two sources, sales invoice and sales invoice lines. And then since we know that we have a primary and a child uh, input, we can just map those both. We can double click to open the component. And the first thing we want to do in the general page is to select the connection manager we created before. We want to choose the action. We support the create action, which creates a new record, the update action for updating an existing record, 
the delete action for deleting existing records, and observe, which is the action we will work with. This will query for records with specific criteria, and if a match is found, an update will be performed. Otherwise, if no matches are found, the record will be created instead. The option Link IDs are scrambled may be selected when there are multiple inputs, and when checked, it assumes the link IDs can come from the source system out of order. Our component will perform an in-memory match and join in this case. We will work with this option or example when we select upsert based on the specified criteria. If there is a match, update will occur, or else if no matches are found, the record will be created in your nav environment. So for the destination object, you may select from the dropdown which will list your available objects. In our case, we will select sales invoice. And then as you can see, there is a child object section underneath. If the destination object has child objects, you may map this from the child. And we'll see later that there will be another um, output column available. On the left side in the multi-threading and batch settings, the batch size by default is set to 50, and this would be the number of records that will be passed in a single call to the service. And you may also enable the multi-threaded writing. And in this case, for our example, we set this to 10, and that would mean that 10 calls are being sent in parallel. So with this example, you'd be able to see 10 calls being run in parallel and 50 records in each of those calls. And this would continue until the process is complete. On the right side in the record lookup or the matching settings, based on the action selected, the record identifier will be primary key. When available, will match on nav records based on their ID of the primary field. And in this case, the manually specified key will allow you to select one or more fields as a key. The next option, handling of multiple matches, has four options available. You can either write all records that match the criteria. You can write the first record that matches the criteria. You can also ignore all records when there are multiple matches found. And the last option, raise an error. This will throw an exception when more than one match is found. Under the miscellaneous settings, the null value handling. By default, it's set to send empty or null values. But you can also dismiss the field. If there is null value, it'll just ignore that field. And then the last option, replace with .NET default values. This will, um, when it finds a null or empty value, it'll just set a predefined value based on the data type. And the last option, force to use chain set. Uh, when you enable this option to use chain set, this provides a way to bundle operations to fail or succeed as a group. Please note that all the operations are considered atomic. So if any fails, all completed operations will be rolled back. So next we'll go into the columns page. Since we selected the upsert, we'll have this first column here to select uh, one or more keys. And these keys will be the matching criteria. The input column is the columns from upstream and the destination nav field is the fields from the nav destination. The data types is based on the destination nav fields, and uh, you can quickly unmap any fields with the last column. When you select the hide map fields, this will hide all mapped fields for you. Otherwise, we have another option that will hide all of the unmapped fields. And for this drop down here, if you do have a child or line item, these will also be displayed, and it'll have its own set of columns that you can map. So at the very bottom, you can quickly clear all the mappings, and then you may also map the unmapped fields. Uh, please note this works if the field names are identical from the input column to the destination field. And it will let you know how many fields are mapped. If we go into the error handling, we can choose an error handling mechanism. And we can also enable additional columns for default output. By default, this is fail on error. But we can also redirect the rows to error output. In this case, the blue would be the default output. And then this additional output would be the error output. And then if we go in the component, we can enable columns for default output. We can enable the record key ID field or the nav record number, and also if the record was new or not. Then we will be able to see those in the blue path, which is the default path. Once you are happy with your configuration, you may press OK to save the changes and close the component. Thanks for watching, and we hope this video has been helpful when working with our Dynamics nav components. Kingswaysoft. Data integration made easy.